I'm Stevie J from Glove Up or Shut Up Wrestling Observer and MMA Odds Breaker with your UFC 174 recap. Now I understand some of you probably skipped this pay-per-view and I know the reason. Ali Bagatinov is not a contender that sets your world on fire. Even though he's the number four ranked flyweight, he's not a name, not a big name anyway, not outside of the hardcore MMA circles. And that's okay. Not everybody should be. Sometimes you have pay-per-views where the main event is just for hardcore fans. So I actually respected that, and I thought this was a pretty decent card overall. But two of the fights that were on the pay-per-view were a letdown, so if you only saw the pay-per-view portion, you might not be so thrilled right now. But let's take it from the top to the bottom. And we were talking about Ali Bagatinov, who fought his heart out in a five-round fight against Demetrius Johnson, but Johnson was just too quick for him. Too good with those knees in the clinch. Did a lot of damage at range. And Bagatino's only weapon was that he got a few takedowns. But he couldn't keep him down when he got those takedowns. Demetrius Johnson would just get right back up. And a couple of times he even did more damage getting up from the takedowns than he did when they were clinched up together and DJ was throwing knees. Why Bagatino kept trying to go for the clinch when all he was doing was eating knees to the body, I'll never know because... Demetrius would just as often as not turn it into a Muay Thai plum and jump up with knees right on his chin. And when they weren't to the chin, they were to the body. He was turning Bogatinov's body bright red. So, a dominant performance by the number one flyweight in the world, the UFC flyweight champion, Demetrius Johnson. Who's he going to fight next? I mean, he's already beaten all the best guys in his division. He's beaten John Dawson, Joseph Benavidez, Ian McCall, now Bogatinov. So... Somebody's probably getting a rematch with him at some point. Maybe Dodson. Dodson looks like he could be the guy right now. Anyway, speaking of future title contenders, we have Rory McDonald taking apart Tyrone Woodley for three straight rounds en route to a 30-27 unanimous decision. And by the end of the third round, it was pretty darn clear that Rory was just on another level compared to Woodley because he, he was just a zombie just standing there taking punishment. And that was pretty much the story of the fight is... McDonald would push him towards the fence, and Woodley could do nothing to evade it or get out of the way. He would think he could stand and trade, and then McDonald would pop off four or five shots and not get caught once. I mean, it was a masterful performance by Rory McDonald. He was very humble afterward. He said, you know, there's a good contender fight coming up in July. They've got Lawler and Brown going for that number one contender shot, and I'm okay with that. I just want everybody to know that I'm here and I'm ready, and one day that belt is going to be mine. So Rory is happy to keep his number two spot, and I'm fine with that. If he wants that, that's fine by me, because they can let Lawler and Brown have their match and determine a title contender. He can be next in line after they figure out which one of the two of them gets a title shot. So moving on, we had Ryan Bader defeating Rafael Feijal Cavalcante. Feijal meaning beans, and I'm um, sorry, he didn't amount to a hill of beans in this fight, and I picked him, so I feel bad for saying that, but... Just because you pick somebody doesn't mean they're going to win the fight. And it was not a good fight. This is one of those two fights on pay-per-view that I talked about that if you paid for this, you're probably a little upset right now. Especially if you only saw the pay-per-view card. Because all Bader did was take him down. And then Feijal would try to get up. Bader would throw knees at his thighs over and over and over again. I mean, literally, just knees to the legs and knees to the thighs. Three straight rounds of this. It was torture. It was not fun to watch. It's a dominant performance by Bader. No question about it. Bader got the win. Bader deserved the win. And that's more than you can say for the next fight I'm going to talk about, which was Brendan Schaub and Andre Arlovsky, where by some miracle, Andre the Pitbull Arlovsky got two out of three judges to think he won this fight 29-28 and picked up a split decision. Not something that any reporter I saw tweeting about it agreed with. And Brendan Schaub was pretty sure he'd won this fight at the end, and so was I. Arlovsky didn't look that good out there. He didn't look terrible. He didn't get blown out of the water. But neither one of these guys was actually doing very good. It was, they weren't aggressive. Nobody was really trying to finish. And both of these guys have, well, are considered to have glass jaws, so... I guess that explains why they weren't going for it hardcore. But you would think 
if you knew your opponent had a glass chin and you thought you might have a glass chin, you'd want to land a punch on him first before he could do it to you. Instead, both of these guys were just trying to avoid getting hit, and it made for one of the more dull heavyweight fights I've ever seen. No buys. Skip this one. If you, if you didn't see it already and you're watching a replay, skip over it. The opening fight of the pay-per-view was Ryan Jimmo and Ovin St. Pru. OSP gets the win via verbal submission at 2.10 of the second round. Either Jimmo broke his arm when he got kicked by OSP, or his arm was broken in a Kimura attempt. It doesn't matter. He was screaming, my arm's broken, but he didn't scream, I tap, or I quit. He just kept screaming, my arm's broken. And OSP didn't take that as a signal to stop and continued to work on the arm until the referee finally pulled him apart and waved it off. So, do you want to get mad at OSP for this? Because it wasn't really, it wasn't a stoppage. Maybe he did worse damage to the arm, maybe not. It's, this is one of those difficult situations. I, I think fighters need to be perfectly clear, not just say my arm is broken. Because you know, so we've seen this before. Just look at what happened with Jamie Varner. He broke his ankle and he still tried to keep fighting for the whole round. And the referee let it go. And most people, including me, think the referee probably should have stopped it. But he let Varner man up and finish the round. Some referees will do that. Some of them think, if you can keep fighting and you don't say I quit or I tap, then I'm going to let you keep fighting. But eventually the referee got the idea that Ryan Jimmo was in no shape to continue. Maybe a little too late, maybe not. But then we move on from that to the UFC on FX fights. And the main event was Kenichi Kunimoto and Daniel Serafian. This one ended very early, so there were 20 minutes of time left to fill. Kunimoto got a very sweet submission, a rear naked choke at 2.52 of the first round. And, I mean, didn't see that coming. I, I would have thought Serafian was the better fighter of the two. But Kunimoto decided to make a statement, and he made a good one, so... Congratulations to him. This was part of a very good set of prelims that I won't complain too much about with one exception. The women's bantamweight fight is not that exception. Valerie Letourneau and Elizabeth Phillips, they had a barn burner. This probably should get the fight of the night bonus. Phillips hurt her pretty badly in the first round, was tagging her over and over again and swelled up an eye to the point it was almost closed. And then for the next two rounds, Letourneau turned it around. Phillips seemed to gas out and Letourneau was out striking her and landing combinations and doing all sorts of damage and was able to get a split decision. Two of three judges gave it to Letourneau, 29-28, and I agree with those two. It was a very good fight. I, I This one I would definitely go out of my way to watch if you haven't already seen it. But skip Eve Jaboyne and Mike Easton. Jaboyne won at 29-28 times three across the board. Thank Ryan Bader. Takedowns, wrestling, boredom. It's Joy dominated, but he didn't do anything. I, I'm tired of this. When Joy wins, he wins decisions. When he loses, he gets knocked out. He's he's not an exciting fighter. He hasn't been in his last seven fights, but he sticks around. He's one of those guys that always sticks around. What can you do? Tai Yun Bang and Cajun Johnson ended by a knockout in the second round, 201. And it kind of looks bad for Cajun Johnson at this point. I mean, he got his jaw broken on the Ultimate Fighter. Then he got knocked out by Taiyun Bang or Bong. Yeah, there were a lot of Bong jokes on the Twitter feed, so that's probably the correct pronunciation. But either way, Bong made an impressive showing here. So good for him, not so good for Raging Cajun. A guy that I like personally, but probably has seen better days as a fighter, because this makes him 19 and 12 now, I think. It's not a good record. It's it's kind of going downhill for him in a hurry. Missionary Tanaka defeated Roland Delorm. 30-27 decision across the board. Not a bad fight, but I just don't really have a lot to say about it. Jason Sago and Josh Shockley at lightweight was bonused onto the pay-per-view at the end. Sago won by TKO at 4.57. He got the stoppage literally a second before the end of the round, but they say three seconds. And you could tell Sago thought that he had it because the, the judge said, you got 10 seconds left, and Sago just turned it on and started pouring on punches on the ground trying to get the referee to wave it off before Shockley could get away and come back for another round. And it worked. So 
Props to him. Saga might get some kind of bonus for that. And he would deserve it too. That's UFC 174. I'm Stevie J.